Okay, um, I'd like to say a little bit about the first chapter uh, of Fred Feldman's Confrontations with the Reaper, um, which is one of the readings for Unit 1. The chapter is called The Search for Death Itself. I think this is a useful chapter because it introduces um, some of the techniques that we use in philosophy and it distinguishes between the kinds of approaches that different uh, disciplines take towards an issue, in this case the issue of death, well, life and death. Um, so for example, Feldman distinguishes between different types of questions surrounding death. There's psychological questions, which are about our state of mind. How do we feel about death? Um, how should somebody who is grieving be treated in the best way? What would be the way to um, help alleviate their grief or something like that? Are there stages in grieving, like um, sometimes has been claimed? Uh, all of those kinds of issues are fascinating, but they're not the kind of questions or the approach that philosophy takes to death. Uh, there's also legal. Um, the, the idea of a will I, is kind of an odd idea. Um, if you think about it, what, uh, whose rights are we respecting if we carry out the terms of a will? We're carrying out, we're respecting the rights of somebody who's dead, who's not there, who doesn't, who's not around to care anymore. Um, so there's, you know, interesting issues about that. Or uh, another legal issue is should suicide be legal? Are there some forms of killing that should be legal, like maybe assisted suicide or uh, uh, killing in self-defense or something like that? Again, interesting questions, but those are legal questions to do with the law. Uh, then there's biological questions. Um, what is uh, DNA? Um, why do organisms die? Uh, why do some organisms die younger than others? You know, some animals have very short lifespans and some, creat some creatures have very long lifespans. Um, those kind of questions, again, interesting, but once again, uh, not philosophical. Philosophical questions, uh, the most basic kinds of philosophical questions are analytic, that is, what is this thing we call death? Um, probably the way most philosophy starts, at least in the way that it is done in uh, England and America in particular, is doing something called conceptual analysis, which is analysis of concepts. A concept is like the definition of a word. Uh, let me distinguish between words and concepts. Uh, we, w you can think of words as labels for concepts. Uh, so, for example, um, the word pen is the label uh, for a concept that includes this. But words are not the same as concepts because you can have different words in different languages. Um, I can't quite remember. A uh, plume, that's right. French, the French for pen is plume. Um, so that would be a different word, spelt different letters, spelt differently, but it would be attached to the same concept. So you can have two different words that are related to the same concept. So the concept is different from the word. Similarly, you can have a word that is associated with several concepts, and pen is a good example. Um, pen is a noun referring to writing influence, but it's also a noun referring to an enclosure for animals, like a pig pen. And it's also a verb. You can pen a novel, uh, or you can pen in some pigs. So uh, right there, there's two nouns and two verbs that are all associated with the same word. So, and those are four different concepts, four different sort of ideas. So when we talk about conceptual analysis, we usually 
um, when you're doing conceptual analysis on something, you have to be clear about what concept you're talking about. And you have to be clearer than simply using the word, because it's very often the case that the word uh, has several concepts attached to it. And you'll see an example of clarifying when uh, Feldman gets to talking about life. You know, he can, he says, um, I, when people say, I've had a good life, they don't mean the same as, is there life on Mars? Uh, a good, you know, the good life that you've had is the totality of your conscious experiences. Whereas life on Mars would be referring to presumably tiny bacteria or something, living things. So when you start conceptual analysis, you have to first of all be clear what it is you're talking about. Uh, and then you proceed by, um, and you see this evidenced in the cha all the chapters from the Feldman book, by giving a definition of the concepts that you're trying to clarify, and then you test the definition to see if you got it right. Uh, so the way Feldman proceeds is quite familiar in philosophy. He gives a definition, and, and he has a kind of um, uh, a little bit technical style. So when he defines a term like life or death, or x, he does things like say x is alive equals df, which means I'm about to give a definition of what it is to be alive, and then gives another string of words like x uh, engages in one of the life functions at t. Yeah, and, it, and on both sides of the definition, he he says at t because well, you know, you don't want to say, um, you don't want to be, give a definition that somehow would be false of the thing now, even though it was true of it later. You want to make sure that um, when you're talking about alive, you mean it's alive at a particular moment if something is happening to it at that particular moment. So the at t business is just to ensure that we're talking about the same time on both sides of the definition. It can look a little bit forbidding, though, all of this equals df and at t and stuff, but it's it's not a very sophisticated idea. Don't be put off by the um, by the technical the apparent technicality of it. It's it's not really technical. Okay, so you start by giving a definition. All right. Imagine uh, I was asking you, because this is what I would do if we met in class. Imagine I was asking you to define the concept dog, or at least you know the concept that we the the noun associated with dog because again dog can be a verb you know you can dog somebody um, but I'm talking about you know the things that run around and bark suppose we all know what those are you know what a dog is you've known what a dog is for a very long time you're pretty comfortable that you have mastered the concept of dog well then define it now why would you why would you have to define it you might think this is you know, philosophers sometimes have a bad reputation of being kind of pedantic or nitpicky uh, because they insist on defining things. But actually, it's a very useful skill to give a clear definition of something. Um, if you don't give a clear definition of something, there's a chance uh, that if two people aren't sure they've got the same definition, they can talk past each other. And I think this is the explanation of a lot of uh, confusion in actually very important debates, like, for example, the abortion debate. Um, I think there would be a lot more agreement than people realize between so-called pro-choicers and so-called pro-lifers if they just sat down and defined their terms more clearly. What do you mean by um, a human being? What do you mean by uh, abortion? And so on. Let's clarify exactly what we mean. So, uh, and actually, it is uh, another area that's very important is in the law, which is one of the reasons why philosophers do well on the LSATs. Their uh, philosophy majors, I think, are second best at uh, the LSATs of any major behind some science or other. Um, and I think that's partly because of this training in being very clear about defining words, because, of course, laws 
are, are written to apply to certain things. A, a classic example is, suppose a sign says, no vehicles in the park, fine $100. And you go in on your skateboard, and somebody says, oh, that's it. Uh, you should be fined for, uh, fine $100 for that. Well, the issue at hand is whether or not a skateboard is a vehicle. Uh, and that actually depends on how you define vehicle. So in the law, uh, uh, you're supposed to actually give definitions of all kinds of things. And um, things like dogs need defining because if you need a license for your dog and you're seen, you know, uh, this ca uh, taking around this fluffy animal on a leash and somebody says, do you have a license for that? And you say, well, no, because it's a fox. Uh, well, should that be covered by dogs, uh, by dogs in the law? Should you get a dog license? Okay, so we all know what a dog is, we think. Let's define it. Well, imagine you say a four-legged animal that barks. Um, well, you'd be tempted at first to say, uh, okay, you might be tempted, particularly if you're a biology major, to say something, a... a uh, an example of the, I don't know, genus Canidae or something. Uh, I was never a biology major, but, you know, something to do with the word canine or, or whatever the genus is. But that would be cheating because you've known what a dog is since long, since you were a little kid and you didn't know what canine meant. You didn't know what Canidae meant. So that probably isn't the real definition you've been operating under. So let's use, uh, let's give a, the definition you're more likely to give, which is a four-legged animal that barks. Okay, that looks like a good definition. However, once you start picking at it, as philosophers do, you see that actually it isn't a good definition. Um, now, definitions can, be, can fail to be good definitions in two ways. One is they can be too narrow. If a definition is too narrow, that means the definition is not true of all the things it's supposed to be true of. So in other words, if you think of a definition as kind of like a sheet, it's too narrow, it doesn't cover all the things it should cover. Uh, is the definition a four-legged animal that barks too narrow? Well, it will be too narrow if it is not true of some things that are dogs. And in fact, it is too narrow because there are dogs that don't bark. There's, uh, there are barkless breeds of dogs, the best kind in my opinion. Um, Basenji, I think, is one of these breeds. Uh, so Basenjis are dogs, but they wouldn't fit this definition. So therefore this definition is too narrow. It doesn't cover all the things that are dogs. And of course, um, if a dog loses a leg in an accident, it doesn't cease to be a dog, but it ceased to be a four-legged animal. So if it's possible, if it is possible to have a three-legged dog, then the definition is too narrow because according to that definition, it's impossible because according to that definition, a, f a dog has to be a four-legged animal. Okay, so that definition is too narrow. You might think that that means it can't be too broad, but actually a definition can be narrow, too narrow and too broad. A definition is too broad if it includes things that it shouldn't. So it's too narrow if it excludes things that it should include, and it's too broad if it includes things that it should exclude. In other words, if the definition is true, if the definition of dog is true of things that are not in fact dogs, then um, it is too broad. And in fact, it's too broad too. I, I don't know if you've seen this. This was a this was a very popular YouTube video for a while. I'll try and find it and put it up uh, on the web. But um, it's one of these Russian. All the best uh, YouTube videos come from Russia for some reason. Uh, and it's a video of this black cat being approached from behind, and the black cat is looking out of a small window, and the cat is barking. It's making barking noises. It's quite amazing. And, and what's funny about the video is this person is obviously creeping up on the cat and the cat can't see because it's looking out of the window. 
and then the, the camera gets closer and closer and this cat is barking out of the window and then suddenly the cat obviously catches sight of this person coming up behind it and instantly stops barking and says meow you know like oh oh shit I've been rumbled I've got to I've got to pretend to be a cat again but it is actually a cat it's a cat but it can bark so it's a four-legged animal that barks but it's not a dog so the definition uh, a four-legged animal that barks is too broad it includes some cats in Russia apparently and maybe it also includes foxes or coyotes, uh, which we which aren't dogs, I think. Uh, again, I'm not a biology major. All right, so there's an example of an attempted definition of a, a very simple concept, a concept we're all familiar with, dog. Uh, and it turns out to be actually a little trickier than we might have thought to give an exact definition. But you see how it proceeds. We give a definition that sounds right, but then the process of analysis means let's really look at this closely and see if we can come up with what's called counterexamples. Counterexamples, a counterexample that shows that a definition is too broad is uh, one is an example of something that is not the term being defined, in this case a dog, but that the definition applies to. So in this case, the barking cat is a counterexample that shows that our definition of dog is too broad. A counterexample that shows that a definition is too narrow is um, one where it's an example of the thing being defined, in this case dog, uh, but that doesn't fit the definition. So a three-legged dog or a Bosenji or a three-legged Bosenji. It doesn't have four legs or bark. Uh, that would be a counterexample that shows that this definition is too narrow. Okay, now, if we were uh, interested in focusing on the definition of dog, then we would try to improve our definition to fix these flaws with it. And in fact, that's exactly what Feldman proceeds to do in the chapters on life and death. He starts with... Um, examples of definitions. So, uh, for example, in the chapter on life, the, uh, the first chapter on life, life functional theories of life, he starts with the definition, x is alive at t, in other words, we're defining what it is for something. x is just a variable, you're familiar with that in math. So, you know, if we're thinking, whatever it is, it's alive at t, we define that as, it's able to perform at least one of the life functions. Now for Aristotle the life functions included nutrition and reproduction which Aristotle thought were related, uh, sensation, motion and thought. Now not all living things possess all of them. Aristotle has this theory that there are different kinds of soul and that plants for example have a very simple kind of soul and that only has the features of being able to take in nutrition and to reproduce. Um, more sophisticated souls have that feature too, but they can have others of the life functions. Like, for example, we, we have the most sophisticated kind of soul because we're capable of thought. Okay, so but the life functions are those four things. Nutrition slash reproduction, sensation, motion, thought. Um, okay, so the first definition is something is alive if uh, is defined as it's able to perform at least one of the life functions. So it's alive at a certain moment if it's able to perform one of the life functions at that moment. Okay. Um, sounds good because those certainly seem to be features that are um, we associate with being alive. However, um, Feldman argues, no, this definition fails. Why does it fail? Well, it's too broad. It's too broad because it is true. The definition, able to perform at least one of the life functions, is true of things that we're sure, we who have mastered, we're, we have some mastery of the concept of life, let's assume. So we're appealing to our intuitions about what life is to test whether or not this definition has captured them. And we can think of things which were damn sure are not alive but 
that this definition would count as alive. And he gives an example, robots or lawn sprinklers. Those would be covered by the definition. Why? Because the definition is able to perform at least one of the life functions, and one of the life functions is motion. So anything that can move itself would be counted as alive according to uh, the definition. And of course robots and lawn sprinklers can move themselves. So that's Feldman's criticism of that first attempt at a definition of what it is to be alive. That it is too broad. Um, now, he does the same methodology for different approaches to life. Like, first of all, he considers life functions which are you know, able to do perform certain functions. Then he suggests considers the idea that life is not being able to do certain things, it's having a certain substance. This is the vitalist theory. Um, and it sounds a little silly in the older versions that because there's this idea of vital fluid uh, that is invisible and weird. And he says if we've got this vital fluid in us, then we're alive. But actually, um, the modern version of this is DNA. If it contains DNA, then it's alive. But of course, as he points out, it's not that simple because dead things have, you know, if I were to die suddenly, I wouldn't be alive, but I'd still have DNA in me. Um, and, you know, you can have, you can find DNA that's been around for ages. Uh, you can find, you know, if you watch CSI, they're finding DNA everywhere. But we don't assume that there's the, the, the smears of, or the hair follicles that they're finding are alive. Okay, so that's the general approach. We're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to settle what it is to be alive and uh, by extension. It, he actually starts by talking about life merely because he's interested in death and he thinks that the only way to understand death is to first understand what life is. Because what he the, the concept of death that he's interested in, and this is something he talks about in the first chapter, is the biological concept of death. In other words, he says, uh, so, he, so by extension he's interested in the biological conception of life. What does this mean? Well, what does he mean, the biological concept? Well, uh, we tend, for example, you might say, what does it mean to say um, that you know, great-grandpa died yesterday. Well, you might say it means his soul separated from his body. Now, unless you believe that blades of grass have souls, and actually, as we see, Aristotle did. He thought that they had a, a very primitive kind of soul, but I don't think most people believe that blades of grass have souls. You know, they're screaming as you, you're mowing the lawn, and the tiny little grass souls are, are flying up. Um, we don't believe that. So, so either you have to say that uh, a plant that dies, or an amoeba that dies, or a one-celled organism that dies, also its body separates from its soul, or you say, well, death is different for humans than it is for um, plants, or something like that. Well, Feldman doesn't want to do that. He says, look, I want to mean the same when I say the elm tree in my yard, well actually ash trees now because they're all getting killed by the emerald ash borer, the ash tree in my yard died. He says when I say died I mean the same thing as when I say JFK died when he was shot in Dallas. Uh, the same thing happened to them. They both died. So whatever death is, it has to be something that can be true of the ash tree and JFK. It's a biological concept. They're both biological organisms. So that's why um, he focuses on things like vital fluid or things like life functions. He's, he, he doesn't talk about sort of mental events because, because nowadays, which actually distinguishes it from a criterion of death, because a criterion of death is something that is very important, and we'll, we'll get to talk about this um, a lot more when we get uh, to the latter part of the class when we're reading Peter Singer's book. Now, incidentally, I just found out that I forgot to order Peter Singer's book for the bookstore. That's okay, 
for you that are buying it online, but if you came in and, and tried to buy it, it wasn't there. However, I've, I've rush ordered some more and they should be there long before we need them. But let me again uh, show you that, oops, uh, this is the Peter Singer book that we'll be using later. It will should show up in the bookstore soon. And he actually gives a little history of the criterion of death that we use now in, in medicine, which is uh, the death of the uh, cortex, cortical death. Now, that's a criterion of death. Uh, we work out when a person is dead by checking whether or not their cortex is functioning. Um, but that's not the same as an analysis of death. That's just a way of telling. It's, uh, it's a bit like um, if you've ever done chemistry and you've got that, uh, uh, what's that paper, litmus paper and you're asked to tell whether or not a fluid is acid or alkali and you dip the litmus paper in and if it's acid it turns red and if it's alkali it turns blue. That's a criterion of the acidity or alkalinity of the fluid. It's a way of testing but it doesn't explain, uh, does that explain what acidity is? No, of course not. Does it explain what alkalinity is? No. It's just a way of testing. That's like the criterion of death. The criterion of death is just a way of testing whether or not someone is dead. So we assume that it correlates with what death is. So there's obviously some, some relationship, but it doesn't explain what death is. What the philosophers are interested in is explaining what death is. What is it to die? Um, and that's what Feldman is trying to get to grips with in these first four chapters. But I wanted to, you know, I wanted to say a bit about what he's doing because even though I think the chapters are written uh, in a fairly uh, easy to read way, uh, they're, they're directed at undergraduates who haven't done philosophy before. There's still the problem that, you know, they're written by a philosopher who perhaps has forgotten what it's like to be a non-philosopher. And, you know, some of the uh, s sort of uh, quirks of academic philosophy are there, like the using the equals DF kind of thing for definition. Just think of it this way. Concept being defined on one side of the equal sign, definition on the other. To be alive is to, you know, be exhibiting one of the life functions. The definition is too broad if uh, things exhibit the life functions that are not alive. The definition is too narrow if there are some things that are alive that don't exhibit the life functions. And a counterexample can show either thing. Either thing. So, once again, the barking cat shows that a four-legged animal that barks is too broad of a definition of dog. Um, the dog with three legs shows that uh, a four-legged animal that barks is too narrow a definition of dog. Okay, I hope that's some help uh, to be going along with. Um, I will post the quiz soon. Um, it's not due until the end of the second week because this is a two-week unit because, you know, there's quite a lot of reading and, and it's you're just starting out. Um, but uh, that's what Feldman is trying to do in these chapters. Okay, talk to you again soon.